So today I, I want to talk about why I don't care about my team's well-being. Controversial, I know. And I want to share my hiring and team management philosophy with you. It's quite unconventional and it flies in the face of the dominant management style in Western corporate culture. And yet I've been seeing very good results with it. So I want to share it with you so that you can improve your own hiring and team management philosophy. What I can promise you is that you will hire better people and keep them with you for a longer time. And it doesn't mean that you need to have employees in the narrow sense of the word. I don't have formal employees other than my wife for tax purposes. My team are freelancers, but they do a lot of work for me. So for the purposes of this video, they are very much akin to employees. And the fact is that as you're growing your consulting business, you will take on a team. As your pay rate per hour increases, there will be some activities that would be foolish to keep doing yourself. So that's why you need to outsource. Sooner or later, this will become an issue and you need to decide the spirit in which you will be hiring and managing people. And so in 2024, it's well-established practice and basically settled science and unquestioned consensus in HR departments all over the Western world. And of course, also among LinkedIn HR influencers uh, that you have to engage, motivate and genuinely care for your employees. You have to implement programs for people's well-being. Spain has recently enshrined in law that women get mandatory paid leave for menstrual pain. All over the West, activists are lobbying for mandatory leave for mental health and so on. All of this is based on the assumption that the happier and more comfortable an employee is, the better they will perform. This was very much the belief when tech companies gave us free lunches, subsidized massages, and pool tables, and all kinds of similar perks that made employees feel taken care of. When Google started doing this in the 2000s, it became then soon an arms race across the tech industry in the quest to attract the best talent. And recently, this has morphed into broad initiatives for mental health. There is now a cottage industry of wellness and well-being consultants who help companies optimize their employees' work experience to even better degrees. A recent article in the Wall Street Journal mentions Mindfulness Fridays at a New York company where managers are expected to hold quarterly heart checks to learn how their employees are feeling about how hard they are working. The article is titled, What it's like to work for a Gen Z boss. Very different. If the early managers are any indication, the workplace will be less hierarchical, more informal, and a lot more focused on mental health. And here's the mention of heart checks. Now, given this proliferation of these types of programs and initiatives, one could easily conclude that the more you care for your employees and the more perks and amenities you give them, and the more you get involved in their mental health, the better people you will attract, right? Because otherwise, I mean, why would companies spend resources on this infrastructure and these programs? So the hypothesis, seems very compelling on its face. Take good care of your employees and you'll get the best of the best. But is this true? The problem is when you consider the immediate consequences of these policies. The question is, who will you attract with this? And I want to state this completely dispassionately and objectively. Objectively speaking, you will attract people who value all of those things, the yoga classes, the free snacks, the mindfulness Fridays, and so on. You will attract people who want to discuss their feelings and mental health at work with their boss or their colleagues. If you as an employer offer days off when people don't like coming to work, you encourage those people to join who won't come into work when they don't feel like it. So that is what you attract. And now the second question is, will those people who are attracted by all these perks and this culture, will they be the hardest workers focusing on the results that they bring to you, their employer? Because after all, this is why you hired them. You only hire them because they add more value to you than they cost you. So you ideally want the most value from them. So you ideally want to find the hardest workers, right? That's pretty clear, should be at least clear. Now, if you're not certain whether these people who value all these things will be the hardest workers, let's play this little experiment in our heads. Imagine you had to bet money on the following. There are two groups of people. And the only thing you know about these groups is that group one contains people who value all of those perks and care about well-being and are attracted to employers who offer these perks. And group two contains people for whom these things do not matter very much. Sure, they enjoy the occasionally freshly made smoothie, but they couldn't care less about Mindfulness Fridays. Now, that's all you know about them. You don't know their you know, skill level and so on. All, all the other things are all things being equal, right? Ceteris paribus, there is no difference between them or that you know of. Now, let's say that your goal is to build a big business and become rich and make your team as well off as possible. And you can only pick one group as a pool of talent. Which group will you pick? Be honest. 
right? Well, I made my decision and I'm picking the group of people who don't care about these things. And that's because I simply don't want to attract people who want to talk about their mental health at work. I don't have any use for it. And so I don't want people like that working for me. And that's why I say somehow pro provocatively and exaggerated, but true in its essence that I don't care about my team's well-being. Now, I don't mean it in a heartless, Spartan, psychopathic way. If something bad happens to any of the people who I work with, I will, of course, commiserate. I'll ask them how they're doing. I'll rejoice with them when something good happens. I feel great when they over deliver and I can give them a bonus. So I'm not this block of ice who literally does not care about them as people. But I care as much as I care about the well-being of any of my fellow people who I happen to interact with a lot. If my son's kindergarten teacher were to share something bad that happened to her, I would commiserate as well. If the sassy lady in the bakery who I see every other day uh, were to share a problem with me, I would listen and I would try to help. But, and here's the difference, I wouldn't listen for a very long time. I wouldn't change my day schedule for her. And I would still expect her to do her job and give me my baked goods with a smile. And that's the kind of person I want to attract. People who do their job despite life's hardships. People with a strong sense of duty and responsibility. And I would surmise that if I put all these things in place, if I care about their well-being, if I do Mindfulness Fridays and whatnot, I might attract people for whom their personal well-being is more important than their sense of duty and responsibility. I recently finished reading the book Shoe Dog by Phil Knight, the founder of Nike, about the company's first two decades. And he attracted great people to Nike because he had a passion for the thing he was selling and producing. Everyone was very hardworking and they were all aligned on the company's mission. Those are the kinds of people I want to attract. Those and people who care about their professional development, about improving their skills, and who want to make money. I genuinely think, and that's like off script here, I genuinely think that employment from the employee's point of view should be something that allows you to prepare for the next level, to gain skills so that you at the next level can already can make more money, you can do more interesting things, you can constantly upgrade yourself. That is what good employment is about. And that's why I don't necessarily expect anyone who joins me in a position that is naturally on the path somewhere where they can improve their skills. For example, a salesperson. If I were to hire a salesperson, I would not expect them to stay with me forever because at some point when they start making twenty, thirty thousand dollars a month, let's say, which is generally like the maximum generally in our space that a salesperson can make. Once they get to that level, they might realize that, well, if they built their own product, they could actually make considerably more. And I'm fully prepared for this. I do not expect that a salesperson would stay with me for decades and decades. Whereas I do believe that these people tend to be quite ambitious. So at some point they will leave me. And that is fine because they will help me build a playbook so that I can then hire the next person. And this person will then be able to build on top of what the previous person has built, what we've learned together. So that is how I see really good jobs. Now, there are other jobs that are purely like task oriented that simply do things that need to get done where you don't learn a ton. And in that case, I see it my goal as an employer to try to make my team as well off as possible within the realms of possibility given that these jobs tend to not fetch as high rates as more qualified jobs. But it's all about improving their skills and making a lot of money. That is the types of people who I want to attract. And I've heard an interesting theory about where this proliferation of well-being and employee coddling is coming from. One really smart guy recently commented on a LinkedIn post of mine and said this. His name is Justin. And he said, our formal social structures, so churches, Social clubs, sports leagues, local communities have all deteriorated and been abandoned by a huge swath of the population, labeled relics of the past and unnecessary. But the necessary role they filled in a human heart has not gone anywhere and can't. So we've misplaced those demands for fulfillment on corporate America and government. Now, of course, he's American, but it's wherever you are in the world. If you expect that your government or your employer will take care of these deeply human needs, like talking about difficult personal subjects, talking, you know, discussing challenging problems that you may experience in your life. You need to do that. I'm not denying this. I am denying the need for discussing this at work. Don't bring your personal problems to work. And whether this hypothesis that Justin mentioned here, whether it's true or not, that this strong sense of the employer who needs to take care of their employees' well-being and personal mental health and so on, that this is coming from an abandonment and a deterioration of the social fabric that we're experiencing, that, you know, churches have less and less attendance, that social clubs are not as popular anymore, and so on and so on. Whether that is true or not, 
I simply abide by the old fashioned approach as work is a place where you go to add value, learn skills and make money. If you have personal problems, discuss them with your spouse, your friend, your therapist, your pastor, whoever, but not at work. It doesn't belong there. And therefore I say somehow provocatively, but it's ultimately true that I don't care about the well-being of my team members. I also don't put measures in place to help them with their health. It's their responsibility. I also don't spend time thinking about how I can make them feel valued and appreciated. If they do a good job, I thank them. If they do a very good job, I give them an extra bonus. And otherwise, I don't think about how I can make them feel more valued. I don't think that is my job. And why? Because I don't want to attract people who want these things in an employer. I want to work with people who want two things. Learn a useful skill and become better at it and make money. Literally, that's it. But here is what I do do for my team. And I think it's these few rules that I've set for myself and these attitudes towards my team that have brought me very good results so far. Because, for example, number one, and this is the most important one, I always pay them within 24 hours of receiving their invoice. In fact, I pay them immediately when I receive their invoice, as long as I'm awake when I receive it. It's one of those few things that I allow interruptions on. I want them to know that I treat their economic well-being and their economic security as a very, very high priority item. Also, I don't reduce their hours even when business is difficult. They're not employees, so there's no fixed pay or anything like that. But I always keep things in a reasonably narrow income window for them so that they don't suffer too much income volatility. Even if I, you know, have a bit of a difficult month, I don't suddenly go all, oh, you have to, we have to cut hours, blah, blah, blah. No, I don't prioritize my own profit margin over their economic security. I also pay unexpected bonuses and I advise them on how they could scale their operations and serve more people like me. I look for ways to give them more work so they can make more money. Good example, recently I was thinking of hiring an operations assistant, but that would be a completely new person. And I know that one of my virtual assistants still could do more work for me. And so I'm thinking, well, could which of these tasks that I would give to the operations assistant, could I give to my virtual assistant? And I found at least one task that is quite comprehensive. That's about 20 hours per quarter. And so I'll give it to him. So that is like me actively looking for ways how I can give the existing team and make them more well off than they are now. Another rule is that I ask them if there's anything else they would like to do in the business and I look for ways how they could grow personally as far as that's possible. I also genuinely want to make them rich, at least by their home country's standards, but their health and well-being and motivation, that is their business. It's their business to stay motivated, to do well and to stay healthy none of mine last year i had to fire someone because she wasn't pulling her weight she was constantly delayed her tasks there were constant excuses there were sob stories and i did commiserate i gave her several chances but things simply didn't improve and so i let her go and i also make this attitude of mine explicit when people apply for roles with me i tell them on the call that this is my approach to things i tell them during the job interview because i want to see their reaction i'm looking for a big beaming smile on their face and heavy nodding because when i see that i know that i have found someone who is going to be a great culture fit. Now, based on the official HR department approved dogmas about good people management, my attitude should be losing me people left and right. But the actual results are that I have a bunch of A players surrounding me, that I have a team I can throw something over the fence to and be certain that it will get done well. One of my VAs recently told me how he, in the early days, barely slept because he was studying while working for me. So he did his work for me at night while studying during the day. He didn't have to do this. I didn't expect that, but he simply did it without my knowledge. And that's how he also won me over. There was quality work done insanely fast. I knew that if I give him a task to do before I go to bed in the morning, it would be on my, in my inbox. Also, the result is no one has left me voluntarily in almost two years since I started hiring people. And that, although the work is quite boring in many ways. And also one of my VAs has recently asked for my home address because his dad wants to send me a gift box from his country. So there's quite a bit of gratitude there. And I think it's because I don't treat my team as children. Grownups take care of their own health, well-being and motivation. And I want to work with grownups.